tonight, uh, you will go ahead and get your marker ready. So now I want to take you on a journey. Y'all can sit down again. Um, as we continue uh, to build our understanding in regards to this ascended life, you you know we're going to go ahead and make you three sections there. Uh, but I want to unpack again uh, the 30, 60, 100 um, series. Like it wasn't intended to be a series, but there's so much to be said. Um, and we are going to recap in a great way right now to make sure everybody's at least somewhat up to speed. The last message was called Earth Alignment. This one will be Earth Alignment Part 2, if you will, but uh, the subsubject will be uh, Life Giving Spirits. Um, so I ask that you bear with me, get your uh, notebooks out, your phone, whatever it is that you might have, because I'm going to give you plenty. Don't knock my uh, knockoff guitar over, over there, guy. Just don't do it. Oh, we shall not move it yet. We shall move the foot. Now yeah, we're talking. How many of you would like to see him to stand the whole time rather than sit? You have friends in the house. Nobody supported you. Nobody supported me, which is common. They were all for you on that one. But uh, I want to ask that you go ahead and get ready to take notes because I want to give you some things that uh, are important to hear. Much of it you've not heard. We're going to recap on some. So do you have three sections here now? I'm going to remind you. What we have here is 30, 60, 100. Those are numbers you've heard if you've ever read the Bible before. Jesus spoke on the soil. It was 30, 60, 100 fold soil. Um, but what I want to start with, I want to take you back down the road we've been down before, is you and I, we are triune. We're spirit, soul, and body. That's what the Bible says. You can write that. It's fine. We are spirit, soul, body. Um, we are comprised of three parts, if you will. And um, if you look in the Old Testament, you're going to look at the temple of God, the tabernacle, and you're going to see that it also is made up of three specific parts. Um which the Bible says is a type and shadow of things to come. What you see in the Old Testament is alluding really to things we should expect to see in the future. Most of the future things are referring to now, not later. Um, so you look at the temple in the Old Testament, you're going to see that there is the outer court. That, of course, if we are now the temple, the Bible says we're the temple of God, uh, the third chapter of the same book we're in now. We are the temple of God, the sixth chapter also of the same book we're in now. Um, so the outer court, if you look at the Old Testament tabernacle and compare, you would know that our body would have to be the outer court of this temple. Okay. The holy place is the soul. For us, that is the mind. The holiest of holies is the spirit, which is, of course, where they kept the Ark of the Covenant. So let me paint you a picture real quick in case you don't know. There was the outer court, and in the outer court, that's where they did the sacrifices, like Paul says in Romans 12. I uh, beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies, that's the outer court, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And then you go into the uh, into the temple, and you're going to see that there's a smaller area within that court, and it's divided into two sections by a curtain. Um, there, of course, is pillars that are indicative of our senses, but I'm not going that deep into temple right now. But you'll see that that inner part of the temple was divided into two parts. There was the holy place and then the holiest of holies. And this place here is where all of the works of the sanctuary were done. And this place here, there was no works done at all. It was only a matter of the blood. In the holiest of holies, in the Old Testament uh, temple and in us that's where the ark of the covenant abides that's where the blood is applied that's where the glory of god comes upon so you look at the old testament tabernacle and you're going to be able to see in our own bodies the layout of what to expect and what you can see so the point is is i want to take you down a road as we have been doing that expresses what it's like in the faith to live out of each of these realms because the bible says that which is born of the flesh is flesh that which is born of the spirit is spirit we've been born of the spirit if we're all born again i imagine we should all be born again is there anybody here not born again that's great so we're all born again that means we are all spirit that means we have been unified with the lord jesus christ literally not figuratively one spirit with him he abides within us in union in the very holiest of holies of our of our heart 
in this place. It's a matter of the blood only. There are no works. How many of you have read the Bible? It says you're saved by grace through faith. It's not of works. You're not going to boast about it. It's right. only a matter of grace through faith. But then you'll see other scriptures that say, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, that you'll be judged according to your works. And you begin to wonder, well, is it works or is it grace? I would have to twist my theology to make it fit whatever I wanted in order to make sense of the Bible unless I understood that when it says grace, it's speaking spirit. When it says works, it's speaking soul. Just like it was in the Old Testament temple. They had the table of the showbread. They had, they had uh, the lampstand. They had all of the working instruments of the tabernacle in this place. No work was done back here. The blood would be brought out from the place of sacrifice. They would sprinkle it on all of the instruments, and then they would go in and apply it to the mercy seat. The word for mercy seat is propitiation, which is literally speaking of Christ himself. So the blood is applied in the holiest of holies, which is your spirit. That's where the blood is. You can do no work there. You're not allowed to sweat in that realm. All of your works, if any, are going to be done here. None of your works are going to be done here. Do we get it? So I want you to think about something. You can probably sit in your chair there for a minute. If you hear something you think that you need to write down, just write it without me telling you. I'll tell you if there's something for sure that you need to write down. But if there's anything else you think they might need to know, just slap it up there. You can always erase and we can write new things. But uh, I want you to think about something. Jesus didn't really ever preach the cross. <laughs> but he did, however, often speak about the kingdom. And... Sadly, the kingdom is uh, still in most of the church world's minds a mystery. And it should not be a mystery because it's the very place we should be living from. It's the very place we should flow out of. It's the very, um, not just place, it's the very principles. It's the very, uh, it should be the heartbeat of our being. It should be where we abide. But much of the church world, when they hear kingdom, it's just a word. Um, they think heaven only, and that is not what kingdom is limited to. Uh, it is the power, the authority, the function, the way things go in God's realm. So kingdom is bigger than that. And we need to understand what that looks like. Now, when Jesus spoke about the kingdom, he typically did so by using parables and would give examples of what the kingdom is like. Even John the Revelator, which I don't know why he doesn't play that anymore. Why does he not play that? No. John the Revelator. Can you play that at the end of this? Good. He's going to play John the Revelator for us. So even John the Revelator, who saw the place heaven expressed what he saw by using descriptive language just like jesus did he said that he saw one sitting on the throne who was like jasper and like a carnelian stone and what he was trying to do was give expression of a higher realm in terms that people who were in a lower realm would understand the kingdom is of a much higher realm than the natural realm that we uh, live in on a day-to-day -day basis. The kingdom is a completely different realm, a completely different dimension. So what was Jesus' prayer? He said, and I want you to recall, he said, Thy kingdom come, thou will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. But what else did he say in regards to the kingdom? He said, to say not low here or low there, for the kingdom of God is where? Within you. Do we actually believe that? Or are we still looking low here and low there as if it's not within us? Because the truth is, much of the church has eyes to only look low here and low there and has disregarded the fact that Jesus meant exactly what he said when he said the kingdom of God is within you. Much of our theology, theology has been twisted and, and torqued so much that we've only believed what we're willing to accept and dismissed a great portion of the things that are written. Jesus said a lot of things that if we would believe them at face value, we would have to admit that much of our theology is simply not right. Because he said things that challenged in every respect religion and the things of religion. He said things that challenged carnal mindsets and ways of believing. He said a lot of things that even today would challenge a lot of our doctrine and our theology and our mindsets. And yet, sadly enough, even after Jesus would rebuke us lovingly with truth, we would turn back around and go right back to the hem of the garment as if him isn't living in us. Do you hear me? That's offensive because people love that song. I'm telling you, I have zero interest in the hem of Jesus' garment. Why? Because he lives in me. I have all of him. 
and all of his garment and every hymn that was on that garment and everything that he stands for, all of his blood, all of his spirit, all of his power, all of his authority, all of his name, all of Christ is in me. I'm not interested in a tassel. That's what it is. I'm interested in the one who wore the tassel and all four of them for that matter. That was a priestly garment that that song speaks of, but it's 30 fold. It's the kind of song that separates us from Christ. It puts him here and puts us there. We're hoping yet again, he'll pass by. We can touch a tassel so we can get a little touch. That is not new covenant. That is not who we are in kingdom. That was what it looked like before Calvary happened. And yet the church is not satisfied with the work of Christ. We would rather hope that he passes by so we can get a brief touch not good not good not good but notice what the Bible also says it also says that the spirit of God is the earnest of our inheritance that means that he is the down payment of our inheritance he is the literal portion of heaven that abides within us do you hear me? So now that the Spirit of God has come and you've been unified with Him and you're one being with Him, it is written. And the kingdom is now abiding within you, it is written. Because of this, the very expression of your nature should be kingdom. There's literally no more need to parabolically attempt to describe the kingdom of God because it's within you. You're the church who has the living God in you. His kingdom is fully abiding within you. Now, by nature, because your nature has been changed, we are to go into the world and not twist parables, but to express that kingdom and demonstrate that kingdom and live that kingdom and express that kingdom simply out of who we are. Are. There's three people on board with me. Maybe we'll get eight or nine before it's over. For the kingdom to have expression in the earth now, the church is going to have to take her seat, which is right here. The church is going to have to take her seat and allow her new nature in Christ to release kingdom into the earth. That's earth alignment. What we're looking for, because here's what happens when you get born again, this is made perfect exactly like Jesus, 100%. You're unified with him. You say, I don't believe that. I don't care if you believe it. The Bible tells me so. So the Bible says that we're unified with Jesus. He is not moving into a dirty tabernacle. He cleanses this 100%, and that holy God unifies himself with us. This right here is the holiest of holies, and it's as holy as it can possibly be. It is holy, holy, holy in your thrice holy spirit right now. It's as holy as any place on heaven and earth. It's as holy as God can be. Why? Because God is living in there. Amen. Your soul, Romans says, the Apostle Paul says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's your soul seat. Be transformed. So obviously, you've been transformed. You're being transformed. You will be transformed. You've been transformed. You're being transformed. You will be transformed. So what the church cannot do is be seated here in the spirit and then continue in mindsets down here. What we cannot afford to do is be seated in Christ Jesus at the right hand of glory, hid in Christ, and we've died and we're hid in Christ and God, that we been made clean we forever perfected in righteousness in Christ we cannot afford to be seated here made to sit there by the Lord himself and then continue to think like this because as long as we're thinking like either one of these we're going to express the realm in which our mind is fixed upon what does the Bible say fix your mind on things above not on things beneath what does the Bible say be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed means your mind has the need to ascend, to ascend and come into alignment with where you're already seated. The church, misfortunately, much of the church world lives from here. Some of the church world lives from here. This realm is the bulk of what we call a good church in America right now. This realm is ultimately, truthfully, where Kingdom Life Church has spent most of our time. 
The goal of these teachings is to get us into a realm up here and not just to taste here, but to sit down and to live from there, to squarely abide there, to not get back up, to not go back down, to not be on a roller coaster, but to take our seat where we belong and abide there and live from there and speak from there and think from there and produce from there. That is the goal. Because at the end of the day, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, that the hope of all creation is that you and I would manifest. They are groaning. All of creation is groaning, hoping that the church would manifest as sons of God. It's one thing to be born again. It's another thing to manifest sonship. And it will never happen until you live from your seated position in heavenly places. You cannot be down here tormented in your mind, given a place to every wind of doctrine, tossed to and fro here and there. You cannot live out of this place warm and dirt. I'm just a scumbag barely getting by. Um, they're pretty good, but I'm not that good. Maybe one day I will be. No, we're all there already in Christ Jesus. We're all one already in Christ Jesus. The conflict is in our mind and what we're willing to believe and where we're willing to think out of. The conflict is not position. We've been positioned there by the blood of Jesus. You can't earn this position. The conflict is where you've got your mind. You've got to get your head out of the sand. You've got to get your mind out of the gutter, out of the dirt, and let it be renewed by the Spirit until it is that you're here. Do you understand? Yes. Does that make any kind of sense at all? Yes. The whole not me, not yet mindset, waiting for the expression of the kingdom to be later on is religion, and we need to get rid of that mindset. Will there be a millennial reign? Most people believe so. I'm not here to even talk about that because at the same time, yet again, every scripture is multifaceted. Jesus said already, even before Calvary, that the kingdom of God is within you. So what we need, what is most important for the earth, what is most important for the church, is that we would go ahead and begin to express what's already within us. That we would stop looking low here and low there, sitting on our porch, looking at the sky, hoping it will split. And um, let me tell you, if there's anybody that's ever stared at the sky for long periods of time and prayed that the Lord would split it open, there would be a shout and the voice of an archangel and he would call my name. It's this guy. And I sat and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed and hoped for it. And I'm going to tell you, even now, I would like in this very instant that there would be a shout and the voice of an archangel and we can see the dead in Christ rise first. And then you and I that are alive and remain will be called up to meet the Lord in the air. Do not misunderstand what I'm saying because it it is a blessed hope. Nevertheless, I am not spending my every day looking only to Christ to split the sky open. I know that Christ is already in me and he split my heart wide open and right now I ought to be one that's going to shout in a voice of my own because I go out with the power of the Spirit of God living kingdom. And you and I have got to do the same. We've got to stop with the low here, low there, and understand that the treasures of heaven are there. That Christ is already abiding within us. Everything we need for a life of godliness is already in us. It's already written. We lack no good thing. We lack no good thing. We lack no good thing. How many good things do we lack? We lack no good thing. We've been blessed with all, how many? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I'd say it's obvious that if that's true, it's either the word's true or our experience is true. One or the other is true. But the truth is, God says we lack nothing. We're equipped with everything, and yet we're living like none of it exists. That must mean that the problem is in our court. If God says we're seated, if God says we have it, but yet we're not seeing it, then why? I'm telling you why. It's because we've got our mind in another realm. The soul is the only thing that can be swayed. Your spirit is on lockdown and seated. You had no power over it to begin with. The blood is why you're seated. You did not have any control over this. You believed and God did the work. Now you're down here. This is what has the ability to ascend. This is what has the ability to descend. This is the problem. This is the winner. This is the game breaker. Whatever the case might be, this guy here is what must come into alignment with God, what God says is already true. Right. So you've been born again and you're a new creature. What does that look like? Does that just mean? Well, I'm going to ask this because I wondered it. I didn't even wonder it. I just believed it by default because nobody ever told me. Does that just mean my sins are gone and now I'm fresh and I'm new? No, that's not what that means. It obviously means that in a basic sense, but I'm a new creature. And the context of the word means I'm no longer like I was before I met Christ. That he literally destroyed my entire makeup as a being and destroyed it and made me a new creature in Christ Jesus that I'm now unified with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. 
Now, again, and I make this disclaimer so that there's nobody that is misconstruing what I'm saying. There is much heresy on TBN. There is a lot of heresy on your TV preachers. But here's the facts. That the Apostle Paul even spoke this truth because it is a truth. You cannot be unified with God and be the same kind of creature that you were before you were unified with God. You're not little gods in the sense that they teach it. But you are the offspring of God. You're the literal sperma of God. The seed of God that has birthed Christ in the womb of Mary is the exact same seed that you are birthed into the kingdom with. It's not a different seed. It's not another seed. The Bible says there's one seed. His name is Christ. You enter into that seed by faith. You literally become in union with the Lord Jesus Christ and become the literal children of God. Amen. So God sent his seed and in a moment we were born again in the exact same manner that Jesus was born in the womb of Mary because the spirit of God overshadowed the virgin. God deposited his seed within that woman and out came a holy child. Well, what happened for us? The day we believed upon Jesus Christ by faith, that same Holy Ghost overshadowed us, deposited that exact same seed within us, made us born again out of heaven. We're no longer born of the dust. We're born of heaven. We're a new creature. So much new in fact that God has moved in. He's destroyed the old and unified himself with us. Amen. So the first Adam was a living being that dies. But you're now one with the life-giving spirit who cannot die. You need to hear exactly what I'm telling you. You've been formed in newness of life, and that life is eternal. So the new creature that you are is now not created out of soil. Your old creature was born after Adam. Created and formed out of the dust of the earth. Your new creature is not formed out of the dust of the earth. Your new creature is birthed out of the very loins of God the Father. Your old creature that is destroyed was formed out of the dust. Your new creature is birthed. Your new creature is birthed. Do you hear what I'm saying? The first Adam was a living being. The last Adam is made a quickening or life-giving spirit. That's what our text says. The first man is of the earth. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So you are born in the similitude of the second man. And furthermore, you're unified with the second man. That's Christ who is Lord from heaven. Folks, we're not necessarily looking to build a church. I need you to hear what I'm saying. We are not necessarily looking for a revival. We're looking to give life, according to Romans 8, to all of groaning creation who is waiting for the sons of God to manifest. What does the text say? Does it say they're waiting for the rapture? Does it say they're waiting on a sovereign move of God? Does it say any of that? No, it says that all of creation is waiting, Romans 8, for the manifestation of the sons of God. So if we've received the life of Jesus Christ and we've been raised with him to heavenly places and we now share in his resurrection, then by necessity we're seated with him and we're seated in him and we're unified with him. Let me tell you an absolute fact. Everything, everybody that is seated in the seat of God has the authority of God, has the power of God, has the name of God to function in. Everybody that is seated here has the exact same power and the authority of the one who possesses that throne. Now notice, Satan tried to set his throne up in heaven and take that position. He tried to say, God, I'm going to rise up above your position. I'm going to make my throne in the heavens, whether you like it or not. And God said, no, no, you're not. In fact, I'm going to cast you down as lightning from here to the earth. That means it's pretty difficult for you now to go before the throne night and day and accuse anybody because you've been cast down. And now because the accusations are gone, says God says, I'm not quitting everybody. I've thrown you down to the 30 round, but watch what I'm about to do. I'm about to take my people who believe upon me by faith. I'm going to raise them up. I'm going to put them in the seat, the very seat that you tried to take. I'm going to give it to them as a gift, the very thing you tried to steal. 
So religion tries to work its way, right, to here. It's always trying to pull something down for a higher realm. It's always praying that something would come down and bless the realm that it's in. It's never reading the Bible in context enough to know that the will of God is not to pull down, but that we would understand he's raised us up so that we could push down. The will of God is not for us to beg God, God send this, give us that, pour this out, rain this, rain that, revive this, whatever. That is not the will of God. That is 60-fold at best doctrine. 60-fold Christianity says let it rain, let it rain. Let the fire fall. Let's get a move of God. We need revival. Bring it down, bring it down. 100-fold Christianity says I am revival. I'm seated in heavenly places. Where I go, the kingdom goes. The power of God goes. When I lay hands on something, somebody things happen. I'm not begging God to send something down because I'm not in a place where he can send something down. I'm seated above, far above, principalities, powers, rules, dominion, might. Every name that is named, not only in this life, but the one to come. I'm seated far above, far above, principalities which abide in this realm. I'm seated. So I'm not begging for revival. I'm up here. I don't need reviving. I'm not begging for rain. I'm up here. That's where the rain comes from. I'm not begging for fire. I'm up here. The fire don't need to fall. I'm in the fire. I'm right smack dab squarely in the middle of the one who is the all-consuming fire i'm not down here begging i'm up here knowing that god has already done the work but the church is living out of one of these realms because she does not understand what the book says why does she not understand first because we've not rightly divided it secondly because our teachers and our preachers are bound in 30 60 themselves and therefore they're not getting the results and they're not teaching the things that they don't understand you're not going to teach hundredfold of what you've ever experienced to 60 but I guarantee you, it's not God's best for us to sit here in the prince of the power of the air's realm and beg that God would send something to us. Send us a mantle. Let the fire fall, God. We need a gift to come down. No, God's saying what you need is to understand that I've blessed you with how many spiritual blessings? How many? All of them. I've given you all things pertaining to life and godliness. You lack no good thing. You're a treasure in an earthen vessel that abides within you. You're the habitation of God. Stop living down here and begging for this and come sit down. And then on the way home, we put in Phillips, Craig, and Dean and let them tell us that you're God in heaven and here I am on earth. No, no, no. No, no, no. You're God in heaven and you raise me up to be seated with you. I'm not of the earth. I'm of the one who is Lord of heaven. He raised me up. He raised me up. So religion tries to work its way up when God has called us to be seated and to rest. We were recreated in Christ Jesus to be the very avenue that the kingdom invades the earth. The church is the avenue that God has uh, instituted to issue forth all the power and all the change that you read about in this book. We are the avenues that he's called. The Bible says we're the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. What exactly is an ambassador? If I sent you out as an ambassador of Kingdom Life Church, that means we've sent you with all the power and all of the authority of Kingdom Life Church. We've given you money to do the job you need to do. We're going to put you in a room. We're going to send you an entourage to protect you. We're going to send you a mentor to guide you. We're going to give you everything you need to do the job. But your responsibility is to go out to the earth. And to make the rest of the earth look like Kingdom Life Church. That's what an ambassador is. So you're an ambassador of Jesus Christ. That means God's given us all things, everything, all power, all authority, all resources. We just got to believe it to see it manifest. And so we're called to go out to the earth and make heaven look like earth. We're not called to go out to the earth and then beg God to send heaven into the earth. We're to go out to the earth and understand we are heaven. We're abiding there. That's our treasure that we're seated there. We go out into earth and bring heaven with us. Amen. So the first Adam, he, he dies. He's a living being. The last Adam, as Jesus Christ, is a life-given spirit. And that is exactly who you're joined together with. It's your new nature. Nature produces naturally. It's not forced. You don't beg for it. You don't live below its standard. 
It naturally happens. If you're born of the kingdom and you really believe that you're born of above and your spirit of God is abiding within you, if you really believe that, you take a seat and you rest innocent, accepted, and loved and know that you're fathered and he's not against you. He's not a taskmaster who's lording over you that wants to beat you down for everything you do wrong. That's not who he is. He's a father. If you understand that, then you're going to live in peace and you're going to live fathered rather than uh, under a schoolmaster and then therefore you're going to be able to produce the kingdom of God. I gave you the example. I wasn't even going to mention it, but I'm going to do it one more time because we've got new ears and we have a camera. Y'all remember me telling you before that, look, there's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's a tree of life. There's two specific trees. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil exists in both of these realms. There's always a good and a bad in both of these realms. There's always a striving for more in both of these realms. This realm, there is no more. It's as much as you can have. You're not striving for more. There is no good, evil, left, right. There is just in Christ Jesus. Down here, you're reaching for more. You're knowing that you're lacking something, but up here, you're not. So a tree of knowledge of good and evil. Tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Tree of life. So I gave you all the example of Enoch. That would be my two-year-old. Um, and this is important to consider. And I'm going to recap just real quick. If Enoch, and this is what he does, drives us outright nuts. He destroys the house, outright destroys the house. So you'll go through the house and uh, you'll see goldfish crackers everywhere. You will see Capri Suns flipped upside down, squashed all over the carpet. You will see candy here, candy there, food here, food there. He'll go in the kitchen, he'll take his poopy diaper off and he'll drop it right there if he feels like it. He'll go sit down at the kitchen table naked. He'll yell at somebody, he'll knock the baby over on purpose when he passes by. All of these things that are just outright demonic, you would think. And then he'll come to us and he'll sit down and he'll expect us to hold him. He doesn't expect judgment. He doesn't expect to get beat down. He doesn't expect... Any of that, why? Listen closely, because I said it before, because he's not done anything wrong. I did not say that he doesn't understand that he didn't do anything wrong. I said because he's not done anything wrong. The Bible says that it's by the law that you have the knowledge of sin. Where there is no law, there is no transgression. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil is where the law comes in. The tree of life is life. He just lives. He knows that he's fathered. He knows that dad's going to probably pick up his diaper. He knows that mom's going to clean up those crackers. He's going to get the rod of reproof. He's going to get a spanking sometimes. He's going to stand in the corner, but at the end of the day, he doesn't wonder if I'm going to quit paying the bills. He does not wonder if he's going to have food to eat. He does not wonder if we're going to hold him and love him. He does not wonder because he's fathered. He's not down here wondering, is it good? Is it evil? Are they going to rebuke me? Are they not? No, he's up here. He's living. He's fathered. We've been raised up to this place in Christ Jesus. We're not asked or called to abide in either one of these realms in which we look at our life independent of Christ and whether, wonder whether or not we measure up. Wonder whether or not God's ready to rebuke us because we didn't do good today. God, I didn't pray as long as I did last night. Uh, are you pleased with me? None of that is hundredfold. All of that is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, do not eat of that tree. Come up here, take a seat. Let me love you. Let me hold you. Live out of kingdom. Let me father you. I will supply all of your need according to my riches and glory. You lack no good thing. If you drop the goldfish, I'll get it. I'll teach you that it's not good, but if it happens, don't worry about it. I'm still going to father you. You're not under judgment anymore. You're a son of God. You're not under condemnation anymore. But what happens if I go to the kitchen and I use the bathroom and I walk by the baby and I drop kick her? What happens if I break Bonnie's glasses on purpose? What happens if I sling my food in the floor because it's burnt again? What happens? I know that it's not right. It's wrong. I expect that nobody's going to hold me. Nobody's going to hug me. Nobody's going to pat me on the back. Nobody. Why? Because I've already eaten of a tree here that tells me right and wrong you're condemned. And the truth is this, when Jesus hung on the tree, the very tree he was taken out of the equation is this one, so that he could raise us up out of the realm of that tree so that we could live as sons of God in peace. Glory to God in the highest, Amen. on earth, 
peace and goodwill toward men. God's not mad at us. There is therefore now no condemnation. He's your father, your son. He's received you. He's not turning his back on you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He will finish the work that he has started. He's looking to father you, to lead you, to guide you, to clean up your diaper, to pick up your crackers. He's not mad at you. But you believe he is because your mind is in a realm that tells you you don't measure up. <coughs> At the very moment you sit down and begin to agree with God, you no longer wonder if you measure up because the measuring stick was Christ and there's nothing left to measure. If his righteousness is now your righteousness, how righteous is he? The Bible says that you are the righteousness. Who? You. You of the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that he has per forever perfected them which are sanctified. Amen. The word there is speaking in context of your spirit. I'm telling you right now that God views you in the exact same way that he views Christ. Even when you knock over the baby, that God still loves you and says you're innocent even when you've dropped the crackers on the carpet. That God still receives you because he's your father and therefore, we have the ability, if we would take our seat, live from that place, and understand that we've been unified with the one who is a life-giving spirit and not a living being that can die, then we can live our life in peace, let it happen, produce fruits, bear by nature the very things that God has deposited within us, and not live under condemnation, fear, judgment, and question as to whether or not God receives us. Amen. All of that comes from down low. Religion seeks to improve you, but God seeks to replace you. And once he does, the Bible is explicitly clear. He replaces you with the eternal word, the seed of God, Jesus Christ himself. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. So now you're literally one with Christ forever. And once you surrender to that truth and take your seat and accept it, you're going to begin to see the fruits of that manifest in your life. Just because you have all of these things that are true about you in you in Christ already does not mean they'll produce in your life by default. You must renew your mind and make a choice to come out of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil realm and take your seat up high where you belong. So I want to recap just a little just so you can follow where I'm at. 7.50. Norman, how much time I got left? Times eight. Overtime. <laughs> You're on overtime. You're on overtime. Good. Thirtyfold Christianity says, Jesus took away my sins and one day I'll see him in heaven, but my understanding and experience ends right there. That's body realm Christianity. That's as low as you can possibly go. That's not kingdom. That is not life giving. That realm focuses on the 30-fold body realm. They have a physical church, a physical building. They focus on the fulfillment of their physical duties. They show up, they sing, they go home until it's time to do all over again. That's 30-fold Christianity. If you don't wear the right kind of shirt or cut your hair a certain way or whatever else, that's 30-fold body Christianity, and it's debilitated, it's carnal, it's not kingdom, it's of Adam. You'll hear natural songs. You're going to hear natural perspectives. God's in heaven. Here we, here we all on earth. All that kind of mess. And it's not kingdom. Now, 60-fold Christianity says, Jesus took away my sins. I received his spirit in the upper room and now I can walk in power. And one day I'm going to be with him in heaven later. But my understanding ends right there and that's the end of the road. The good news about 60-fold Christianity is they at least typically shift their focus to God when they worship. God, you are worthy. I exalt thee. I praise you, which is good. It's healthy. But at the same time, most of 60-fold is still trying to pull down into, this, into their realm something of the kingdom. God, send fire. Send rain. Send it down. I'm asking for this. I'm asking for that. That is their greatest hope for now they bind together they have warfare they get results sometimes because they're living in a realm that's right next to the place they should be seated so sometimes they do get results because they practice spiritual principles but at the end of the day it's still not kingdom it's still not seated it's still not fathered all it is is another form of uh, religion that ultimately denies the true power thereof and therefore we've missed it 34 christianity one more time 
lives out of earth on earth supply. 60 fold Christianity lives out of earth on heaven's supply. 100 fold Christianity lives out of heaven in that seated position on heaven's supply. And that's God's best. That's what He's done for us. We're not called to stop at the cross, we're not called to stop at the upper room. We're called to go to where the fire of God is and abide in our seated position. A hundredfold Christianity says that I'm raised, I'm seated, I'm one with God, and right now I can live my life from that position in Christ Jesus. I'm innocent, I'm fathered, I'm at rest, I have peace with God, the kingdom is my supply. This is the spirit realm, that's where God would have us to be, is the realm in which we can release the life that's within us into all of groaning creation, which is waiting for you and I to manifest sonship. 30-fold religion is never going to change the world in a real way whatsoever. It's not going to help groaning creation in the manner that God intends for it to help groaning creation. But the truth is, 60-fold Christianity is not going to do it either. What you're looking at here is the not us group. What you're looking at here is the not now group. They at least believe it, but they don't think it's now. Right here is a group that understands the kingdoms within me. I can walk in power. I've been given all treasures. I have the power of God in this earth and vessel. I can walk in what he says I can walk in and I can get the job done now. The only person that can change creation is who? Anybody? All of the world will unanimously, if they're saved, say, only God, only God, only God can do it. But what they're meaning to say is only the one who sits on the throne. Now, there's a lot of things that we say only God can do that God says you can do in Christ Jesus. That with God, all things are possible. Yes, only the one who sits in the throne can do the majority of the things that we say only God can do. But the truth is we're in God. We're seated in God. We're on that throne with him. And there's a lot of things that are expected to manifest as the result of the sons of God manifesting in the earth. Amen. Only God, sure, but we're in God. We're inseparable now. There is no Christ there, us here. We're not down here while he's up there. We've been unified with him. The Bible says, let us not put asunder what God has joined together. God has joined you and I together with Christ. Why do we continue to put ourselves asunder from Christ? Why do we sing? Why do we teach? Why do we believe? Why do we think in a manner that puts us here and Christ there when God says, I have raised you up and unified you with Christ? What did it say of Christ Jesus? The Bible says that he thought it not robbery. Let this mind be in you. When he says that was in Christ Jesus who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What does that mean? The Bible says let that mind be in you. I really feel the Lord. Let that mind be in you. When he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. What does that mean? Don't think it's robbery that you're seated on the throne in Christ. Why? Because he put you there. You didn't take it. The devil tried to steal it. God cast him down. He gave it to you as a gift. You don't have to think of it as robbery because God stuck you there himself and now he wants you to live from there so you can glorify his name. So you can bring in a harvest. So you can help grow in creation. So you can manifest sonship. So you can bring kingdom into the earth and great power can overtake what we see that's going on now in the name of the demonic movement. I'm telling you, God put us here. Stop Stop thinking it's robbery. Understand that he's your father. Take your seat and live from there. Amen. It's funny because the Bible says it. We're like, no, 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 that's robbery. The Bible said it. It's not me. Let this mind, what mind? Be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Tell me more. Who thought it not robbery? I don't like that. That's heresy. No, it's Bible. It's Bible. What's heresy is you believe what you want to believe that's contrary to the Bible. The Bible says that we are to have the what? The mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you. So what is the purpose of a life-giving spirit? To give life to creation. If God who is a life-giving spirit has unified himself with you, what do you have to give now? Life. Life. It's there. 
You've got it to give to your family. You've got it to give to the stranger. You've got it to give to the neighbor's cat. You've got it to give. I know Vicky trying to give life to animals, aren't you? There's squirrels right now waiting on life to come out of the manifestation of that sun back there. Folks, I'm telling you, creation is not waiting on a good church service to happen. Creation is not waiting on the two witnesses. Creation is not waiting on revival or on the rapture or on the millennial reign. Creation is waiting on the sons of God to manifest. Amen. That is exactly what the Bible says. You want to draw something? Whatever just came to you, like just put it there. Add to this teaching right here. Just something that God gives you. Go for it. If it ain't good, we're gonna erase it. <laughs> Folks, everything he is, we is we are now because of the work of Christ. There's an incorruptible seed in him that is now in you, which just so happens to be the same seed which Christ was begotten of. It's the seed of sonship. We're literally the exact seed of Christ. Who is Christ? Exact same seed. Ask, seek, knock. The word ask in context of the scriptures is not saying, please do this. I'm hoping for it. Now the word ask is really to issue forth a command with an expectancy. Yeah. And when you live out of this realm, you can speak in a way that you expect a certain outcome. It's not me saying, can I get a can I get some peppers with some meat in it, please? No, it's me saying, let me get that now. <laughs> That's what asking looks like biblically. And when you're seated as a son of God in heavenly places, you ask and you receive. You know, it's funny because Jesus walked up on a tree, and I understand the implications. I understand the prophetic meaning. But he walked up to a tree at a time that wasn't even supposed to be bearing fruit. As a son of God, he uh, said, this, this tree ain't got no fruit. I'm going to curse it. I rebuke it. He made a sovereign choice as the son of God to bring death to a tree because he could, because that's who he was. He had the ability to do that. He said, you ain't never going to bear fruit again. I came looking for fruit. You didn't have nothing to offer me. I curse you right now. He made a sovereign choice to do that as a son of God. And I'm going to tell you right now, the Bible says in Genesis, and it says it throughout in respect to creation, that God gave dominion to mankind. Does anybody know what dominion means? I challenge just one person or however many wants to type a <laughs> word dominion into your Google search and look at the definition so that you don't think I'm making anything up. The word dominion means sovereign rule, etc., etc., etc. So the people say, why does God allow this, that, or the other to happen? Because God has given sovereign rule, He's given dominion to man. And we're called as the sons of God to do something about what we see wrong in the earth. He's given us his power, his spirit, his authority. Of course, it's a no brainer. We're nothing without him, but there is no more without him. That without him talk has got to go. He unified himself with us. Remember the chocolate milk. You're not getting the chocolate out once it's in there. Once it's in there, it may settle on the bottom some, and it better not, but it's still there and it's still chocolate. And I'm telling you, once Christ comes in and unifies with your spirit, he's there and he's there to stay. And now we're to go out into the earth and manifest the, the results of the work that God has done within us. This is what God has done. He's sown heaven's best. He sowed the seed of Christ within us. He put it in us. And God's expecting a harvest. God is expecting a corresponding harvest with the very seed that he's sown. I don't put, a, I don't put uh, carrots in the ground and expect in any manner a cucumber. That's not what I'm looking for. But when I sow a seed, I'm expecting the plant to look exactly like the seed is supposed to bring forth. God sowed the only seed that he had, and his name was Jesus Christ. And when he sowed that seed into the earth, it brought forth a harvest which brought forth many sons of God in the exact image of Jesus Christ. And now God is looking for you and I to understand that's a fact, sit down, receive it, and begin to manifest the work that comes into alignment with the very person of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I'll show you a mystery in respect to the church. 
He, he showed the correspondence between husband and wife, between Christ and the church. Somebody tell me when marriage happens, what is the typical approach to the name at that point? She takes his name. She takes his name. Amen. Better yet, she takes his name. He's in there. So now I've got the name of Jesus. <laughs> And I can go out to the earth with the name above every name and walk as I have a signet ring and plant it wherever I want to. See, I come in the name of Jesus. I'm not just using it. I'm not just borrowing it. It's my name by marriage. I've been betrothed to the Lamb of God. And now I can go into the earth and I can use my name that I received by betrothal. There's going to be a great wedding on that day, but that name is already mine. I don't know if you know Jewish tradition, but it ain't like it is in America. You don't get hooked up and then hope it works out. When you get betrothed, it's like a literal marriage. It's concrete at that point. The wedding's later. So right Right now, I've been betrothed to the Lord Jesus Christ. His name is my name. I'm a chaste virgin unto him. I no longer belong to the world. He bought me like a gomer off the market with some wheat and some barley. And I'm telling you, my name has been adopted. And now I have the name of Jesus in me. He lives in me. We've been joined together. We've been brought together. There's no putting it asunder. The name of Jesus is tacked onto the back end of my name. And now when I sign a check, it says Jesus. When I pray for the sick, it says Jesus. Jesus. When I go out and do anything, I take a loan that says Jesus. Why? Because that's the name I've inherited in Christ. Does anybody in here believe that? If we start believing that, we're going to really start manifesting it. Or I feel like i got a solid 20 left. I'll get us out here by 8.30. Lock back on. You can take a nap. <laughs> I'm tired too, man. I've been worn out. Man, I'm going to tell you, if I can, I'll sleep when I die. I've been going 18s and 19s here for the longest time. Go to work from 7 to 5, roughly. Go do some remodeling from 5.30 to 10 every night. Go home, get with the Lord, put together some notes, do some praying. It's 1, 2 o'clock easy. I'm telling you, I'm up with Jesus late. Everybody's down and out by then. And next thing I know, the alarm's going off. I'm like, God, I need to lay here. And then I get up. And the quickening spirit that's within me gives me supernatural energy. I go through my day like it was that I never, it's like I never even miss sleep. And I go through my day. I go back to work. I get to do things during the day. I minister. I witness. I go into ABC Supply in Johnson City. And um, I, I go in and I order some things. And He's like, I can't even remember what day it is since church day. <laughs> and uh, that was just today. Because he's like, I don't even know what day. What day is this? It's church day. You need to get to church. And I go about quicken. And I go about speak of Christ. I go out with the gospel. I go out and live as a hundredfold. I dare somebody sick to come along. We're laying hands. I'm telling you, I dare a devil to come along and let them know that they're loved. Saw a man on a forklift at a place that I'm not even work at. And he pulled up and said, what's your name, man? Because he was cussing like a sailor, cursing the name of the Lord and everything else. I said, what is your name, man? He told me his name. I said, I'm going to be praying for you because the Lord died for you and he loves you. He says, don't be praying for me. I said, I'm going to be praying for you because you're valuable to the Lord. And when I pray for you, things are going to happen. And he was freaked out. He was like, what's your name? I said, I'm a son of God. He rolled out of there all quiet. But the point is this. If I was 30-fold, I'd have gone home and I said, God, I think you can touch that man. I know you're. I know you're able. I'm going to remember him in my prayers tonight. I'm going to be humble and somber, but I'm never going to speak your name if that's 30-fold. 60-fold says, I know we can. You know what would be really good if we can get you down to the revival and three or four of us combined together. We can put some anointing oil on you, and I believe by then you'll get free. All of that's great, but it's not the answer. The answer is, Son of God, go and manifest. If I run into a need, I run into a problem, I run into a devil, I'm already seated. I'm already loved. I'm already like an Enoch. If I drop a cracker, it don't matter. If I say the wrong thing it doesn't matter none of that matters I'm a son I'm seated I have the power of Christ living in me I go about I use the name of Jesus because it's mine now I go out and do whatever I want to do in the kingdom according to the will of God and I see results because I'm seated a hundredfold church is the only option for growing and creation it's the only thing that's going to help mankind this church will get results sometime 
And this one has a form of godliness denying the power and it's almost useless. Amen. I'm just going to call it like I see it. This one here says the gifts of the Spirit aren't for today. That the Spirit of God doesn't move. Blah, blah, blah. It was for a time, 2,000 years. It's got heresy. It's dead. It's dry. And it's barely alive. This one here at least believes and functions in it to some degree, but they're still looking for mantles. They're still hoping for gifts. I'm not seeking for gifts anymore. I believe to function in the greatest gifts because that's what the Bible says, but I function in them as a son. God laid before me the entire suitcase full of gifts. All nine of them are in this place. If I go out and I need a miracle, it's already there. I'm seated. If I go out and I need to speak in a tongue, you better know I'm going to speak in a tongue. I go out because the giver of the gift has unified himself with me. I'm seated with him and heavenly places now and I can live uh, as a son in the kingdom the cry of the angel was not joy to the Christian the cry of the angel was joy to the world and you and I now have a responsibility to manifest that in the world we have a responsibility to manifest as sons in the earth and bring forth kingdom in the earth we're called to be the sons of God and when we get born again we become a new creature we we have that infant seed of Christ if you will that needs to grow into the full stature of Christ we are called to manifest the kingdom of God by growing into the full stature of God in Matthew chapter 3 you're going to hear the Lord you're going to hear God himself speak of the Lord Jesus Christ these words he said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased he had done no ministry yet at that point but he said this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased and then you go to Matthew 17 where Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration He's shining with the glory of God. The word transfiguration there is indicative of the renewed mind that has taken its seat. That's the image of what it would really look for us, to, like us, for us to take our seat and to live from this place. We would shine with the glory of God and the power of God. We would be ascended to a high mountain, shining with the radiance of the glory of God. But what does the Lord say there? He says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Amen. <laughs> I saw an experiment of a mother and a child. It was like a one-year-old or less. And mom sat down face to face with that kid. And she was teaching the child, um, teaching the child to respond by mannerisms and facial expressions and pointing and all sorts of different things. And they would sit face to face and they would go through these things, these motions, these smiles, the reactions. And the child knew based upon how the mother was responding, what was being said. So then mom did this. She came back like this. And the child's trying to communicate with her. She's blank on purpose. So the child begins to get agitated, begins to squirm, tries to mimic things that it did to begin with to get her attention, started pointing like it did before because by pointing, the child got a reaction from mom. So he figured that if I point now, I can get the reaction. He tried to employ what he knew worked in order to get mom to react in a certain way. So, in like manner, the church, we're planted with the seed of Christ in us. We're infants, but we're still sons, beloved sons in whom God is well pleased. And God begins to teach us by the goosebumps and the presence. And the still small voice and the things, how to respond and how to react to him. And then there comes a point in time in which God is looking for mature sons. Where the blank face comes on. He's expecting you to understand who you are with or without the goosebump, with or without the pointing, with or without the smile or the signals. God is looking to grow you out of a place that does not require a certain manifestation or a reaction for you to understand that you're still a son and can live there. 
A lot of times we say, God, where's your presence? What's going on? And God is trying to bring us out of this realm and teach us who we are with or without. That is the goal. If you do these things, then you'll be like your father who's in heaven, who sends the rain upon the just and the unjust. Your nature will by nature give life. This is not something you're trying to achieve. Can you play some? Not John the Revelator yet, but we'll save that. We'll do that when I'm afterwards. This isn't something you're trying to see or uh, achieve. You're born into this. It's your nature. Now you just produce the life that's within you naturally or naturally into this world. And as you take your seat as a hundredfold Christian in the hundredfold realm, heaven flows out of you down into the rest of the earth. We cannot afford to look up and hope it comes down anymore. We're already seated in the place we're looking. The very person we're praying to, we're unified with. What does that mean our prayers should sound like? How should we be singing right now? What should our songs sound like? How should we communicate with him? I was speaking with the Lord earlier today and I was speaking in a way that I realized that my prayer was treating God as if he was independent of me. And it began to seem weird to me because I realized, and I believe it was God, hey, don't you don't forget what you've been telling these people. We're one. Don't speak to me like I'm a million miles away. We're unified in spirit. When I say, God, I have a need. I, I'd like to see you move in this. I thank you that you're going to move in that and all this stuff. All that sounds great, but at the same time, wouldn't it be better if I understood that, God, I thank you that you're my father and that as I pass through this earth, I'm going to see the manifestation of who is alive within me. The blessings that abide within me are going to manifest and be released into the earth. I lack no good thing. My bills are paid because you're there. You supply all of my needs. You're my father. I don't have to go about and wander. I don't have to beg you. I don't have to twist your arm because you promised. You're my father. Enoch never wonders if I'm going to pay the bills. I'm not going to wonder if my bills are paid. I'm not going to pass through the day and look at my wallet and see $3 and understand my electric bill is $300 and start to freak out because I understand that I'm fathered. If I'm down here, then I'm going to freak out and say, God, I've only got $3. What am I going to do? I'm going to have to do a GoFundMe. God, I'm going to blah, 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 blah. God, I got three greenbacks. Ain't no thing. I thank you that the bill's paid. I don't know how you're going to do it, but I know, God, because I'm in you and you're in me and I'm your son. You're going to father me. God, while I'm at home, I'm going to need some Capri Suns and some goldfish. <laughs> in Joshua chapter 5, you read the story of a time where Joshua and his people were probably going through one of the most important things in all of history. And then the commander of the uh, Lord's army, the angel of the Lord, shows up. And Joshua's like, are you for us or are you for them? And the angel's like, neither. I'm the commander of the host of the Lord's army. In other words, I've not come to choose sides. I've come in the name of the Lord. I'm, I'm a, a representative of heaven. I've come to let the rain fall on the just and the unjust. I've come for the sake of the will of God. I've not come here for good and evil or to pick sides. I've come for this reason. I'm a product of heaven. And you and I, like men, are products of heaven. We go into the earth. We, we give to those that are bound. We give to those that are free. We give money to the drunk man just like we do to the one that does not have a beer in his hand. We go out we bless and we let the rain fall where the rain falls. We've had this the other way around for too long. We look at the rain as a negative. And the truth is, is as sons of God, the rain is what's going when we go out to the earth. We let the rain fall from us. The, the rain hits the drunk and the undrunk. The rain hits the saved and the unsaved. We go out to the earth and we let it rain. We go out to the earth and we let heaven pour out of us. That's what happens as life-giving spirits that are unified with the life-giving spirit. Do you understand? The bad news is, is I have probably at least another hour, but we may have to have a part three. Would anybody be offended if I dragged this out one more week? <laughs> it might be. I want to cut it off because I know we've got some folks that are tired. I'm tired. But I'm going to come back probably unless the Lord redirects me. I always like to make sure God's okay with something. 
And I believe that God was okay with this in the beginning. And that's why we've it's become a series. Because God has a lot of things He wants you to understand. And it's vitally important in 2021 that the things we've been praying for actually come to pass. And that's really going to happen when we understand who we are, where we're seated, what we have, and where we're positioned. So it's no wonder that it keeps getting dragged out. But we'll revisit this, Lord willing. I don't say that very often, but... Uh, We'll revisit this if that's what God wants to do. Come Tuesday when I'm asking the Lord if he's cool with it, we will finish this. Otherwise, we're just going to quit right now.